Hello everyone and welcome to Cook With Me. I am so excited tonight to be showing you one of my all-time favorite recipes. Believe it or not, I do have favorites, just lots of them. Tonight's recipe is savory pancakes and I hope this is something that is going to revolutionize your world like it has for so many people already. I've been making these recipes, this specific recipe and these two variations um, for quite some time now and it's just I've heard from people, been a game changer in their household. So the reason why I think that they're so cool, and I'll let you guys all get all of your ingredients out and anything last minute sorted. The reason why the savory pancakes are so cool is because, for lots of reasons, one, we can make them super easily. They're very quick, very fast. The other reason is because they take the place of sandwiches very nicely in lunch boxes and they can even be popped in the toaster in the morning for breakfast. So a lot of people that I have um, either hubbies, you know, a tradie and leaves, you know, sparrows fart in the morning, 4 a.m., they can quickly grab a couple of these out of the freezer, pop them in the toaster and grab them and go. Um, that's a really quick and easy option. Busy mums on the run that don't take time to eat for yourselves, this is a good way to get a, quite a bit of extra nutrition into you on the fly. Not that I recommend eating on the fly, but I know it happens. And then, like I said, in lunch boxes, kids' lunch boxes, it's, I get the question all the time, how do we substitute for sandwiches? So this is an awesome substitute for sandwiches that we can sneak in a whole bunch of veggies in for as well. So tons of reasons. And then the fact that we can freeze them in the freezer, like it looks like a loaf of bread if you keep them vertical on end and pop them into the toaster. It's just, it's so quick, so easy. Tons of veggies we're gonna sneak in here. And you have the option tonight. I've given you a savory option and a sweet option. So completely both ways we can have a magic trick. And just a quick little story on that. I actually have done these with uh, a kid's workshop, a kid's ki uh, kitchen school workshop that we did over a school holidays once. And I had done them as a matter of fact as a demo the night before at an adult event, um, you know, just for an information night at one of the local stores. And so I cooked up all these pancakes and I'd had all the extra leftover and the kids were starving hungry the next day during this workshop we did with the kids. So we actually fed them the pancakes first and then we were gonna cook them together as a bit of a lesson afterwards. But I happened to, I was making them for an adult palate at the time. So we put in a little bit too many herbs or spices or onion or whatever and they didn't really like them. So on the fly, I created this magic trick, and I was secretly hoping it was actually going to work. Uh, and we got rid of the onion, we got rid of the herbs, and we got rid of the, I guess, the chives and the cheese, if you're going to put the cheese in. And instead, I added banana, a little bit of cinnamon, some coconut sugar or maple syrup, and we just went with it. So we were trying to attempt the magic trick of seeing if we could hide sweet potato, zucchini, and carrot into these pancakes and still serve them as a sweet pancake with butter and maple syrup on it, which is all they wanted. So thankfully, breathed a sigh of relief on that one, it worked. And even though the kids were with us, they put in the sweet potato, the carrot, the zucchini, it still turned out something that they happily ate with a little bit of butter and maple syrup on it. So it is a bit of a magic trick, I think. Whether your kids know about it when you first make them or not, that's up to you. I'll leave that to your discretion. But it is a very easy way to sneak some extra veggies in along the way. And the sweet potato, carrot, and zucchini happen to be kind of the easiest, more neutral ones that we can sneak in pretty easily and still get a dense amount of nutrition out of it. So savory pancakes, different to fritters. Now I do get the question, what's the difference between the pancake and the fritter? Now a fritter traditionally is quite a bit, there's quite a bit more texture in a fritter. It's quite a bit chunkier. And we traditionally cook it in a heck of a lot more oil or fat in the frying pan at quite a high temperature. So that's kind of the difference between it. This is very much a pancake. We can cook it even without any grease or oil in the pan. If we've already got our pan seasoned up correctly. Uh, and so it, yeah, it, it, they're very much like a pancake and we can make it so that the texture, you can't tell that there's vegetables in it, which is why we're gonna need a food processor or a blender. So if whichever one you're gonna be using tonight, please get that ready now. And any of the ingredients that you haven't already got out, grab yourself a sweet potato. This is maybe a little bit large. We might not use all of this one. We're going to need um, sort of a medium-sized carrot. Can we define this as a medium-sized carrot? Do not fret. It's okay with a bit more. It's okay with a bit less. Perfectly flexible. And let's call this a medium-sized zucchini. Not to be technical here. Please do not stress out about me not giving you exact cups or grams. It's not the end of the world. 
Um, I'm going to call this a small onion and I'm actually going to use the whole thing instead of half because I haven't got any shallots. So I'm going to use that one. And I happen to have a couple extra yellow beans in the fridge that needed using up, so I'm going to put them in. You can do the same, whatever else you've got in the fridge. Well, I say whatever else, but pretty much any other vegetable that you feel you could maybe sneak in, um, go for it, give it a try. And then I just went to the garden and grabbed some chives, a little bit of thyme, I think it might be lemon thyme actually, and some other little bits of basil. So we don't need heaps, but just a little bit in there to give it some more nutrition, a bit of variety, a bit of oomph, flavor, etc. It's that easy. Okay, so let's get into it. All we're going to need to do is chop these up enough that the machine that you're using, be it a blender or a food processor, can get into them, basically. Um, and definitely, if you have any questions along the way, please let me know. Definitely wanted to say, oh, excellent, we've got an Amanda and a Zoe watching. Thank you again. Monique, welcome. Who else have we got? Veggie Nanny. Lorraine. Ah, oh, cool. Nice to meet you, Lorraine. Learning everyone here. And Jenny, awesome. Beck, thank you for being on. Sorry if I missed everyone uh, or some people there. Okay, so if everyone's ready to go, give me a big heads up or a big thumbs up and happy face. Love having those. Let me know you guys are catching up to us along the way. And we're going to get this happening. It is a quick dinner, and I know it says pancakes. You might be thinking, why are we making pancakes for dinner? But they're savory pancakes, and it all comes down to what you end up putting on top of them, which is another fun part of the, the puzzle. At the very least, you can just have them with plain old butter or hummus or pesto or something like that, but completely up to you. Now, you know what? While I'm on this topic, I just want to bring this up. Peelers. <laughs> what an interesting topic um, and what an interesting way in which some people can have stress in the kitchen and not even realize it. I have been to friends places or to other people's places and used peelers that were probably more frustrating than sitting there with an actual knife and peeling it individually. So if your peeler is a piece, <laughs> I'll leave it at that, um, maybe consider getting a new peeler. You can get a really, really good one. This one in particular, no plug intended, um, is an Ikea peeler. It's very heavy actually, and it's probably one of my favorite little kitchen devices. I, I don't know, it might be $7 or something at Ikea, but definitely a good investment. Uh, so getting a peeler. The other thing is I see most people peel towards themselves like this, and I even got scared doing it there for a second because my wrist is right here, and it's actually quite a bit slower, I find, because you have to be so much more careful. So I'm not going to make you change your habits today, but maybe you want to have a try at this at some point and see if you can peel away from your body, especially if you've got kids watching you, developing habits by watching. Okay, so peeling away from the body. When we do that, it's very quick and easy, and we can pump through a lot faster and a lot more safely as well. So try to repattern those brains <laughs> to uh, peel away from you. Sweet potato tends to oxidize quickly, so I tend to run it under the water um, when I'm done with it, but that's just another little tip or trick. These skins were not in the greatest condition. This um, sweet potato was a little bit old and it was starting to sprout in some locations. So I'm actually not gonna use these in broth like I normally would save them for. They're just gonna go into our compost. And then as far as the zucchini and the carrot go, like I said, we just need them to be in small enough pieces that we can put them through the food processor. So that's all we're going to do there. You can literally have this dinner on the table in about 10 minutes. Carrot included. Very quick, simple. With the beans, I'm just going to top and tail them and let the food processor do the rest. There we go, top tail. I'd love to hear if there's any of you guys that have never made this recipe before that are going to try putting in something random. I want to hear about it and I want to see the results at the end. So let me know what you need to clear out of your fridge. Sometimes the best results come from either people being really brave and daring or mistakes. So don't be afraid. It's just a kitchen. It's just food. There's always a workaround. And at the very worst, those of you that have my personal email address or phone number, go ahead, it's okay. If you have a complete stuff up that you're about to throw away, give me a call, please. And maybe we can, uh, can save, the, save the meal, prevent you from having to throw it out. Okay, stubborn onions, we'll cut them in half first and then see if they're any easier to peel. Normally they are, yes. And onions are notorious. I wanna show you this. 
please um, be aware of this. These little black spots on there are not necessarily innocent. Those That is mold. So we're not going to throw it away, but we're going to give it a very good wash. If you have a bowl of vinegar water going already, please put it in that as well and try not to get that in contact with anything else before you wash it. So it is pretty hard to get onions without a little bit of that. Um, but just, yeah, just be aware of that instead of just thinking, oh, it's just some black spot. Um, that's what we want to do. Okay, let's get those into the compost bucket. Okay, so good question from Lorraine. Were there any beans in the ingredient list? No, there weren't. So I was just um, going to add them in because I had them in the fridge and they needed to get used up. So if you don't have beans, don't worry. They were just a little add-in just to show you how flexible this recipe is, Lorraine. Um, and, and just, I guess, how much option, how many options you have for other veggies you can put in. I've even put in mushrooms before. I've put in bits of pumpkin. Uh, what else have we thrown in there? Little bits of button squash. Uh, yeah, you could, there's a lot of different veggies you can include. So I'm just, I just added the beans in because I have them, them, them there, but you do not need them. Okay, quick little chop on the onion. And again, I'm going to let the machine do the rest. It doesn't need to be anything more than that. And our herbs, same goes. There we go. Okay, into the food processor. Now, if you have too much for your food processor to handle at once, let's just do that in batches. So you'll get a, um, it'll be a lot easier to work with if you want to do that in batches. Does not need to be a Thermomix for this. Uh, blender works as well. We kind of want to puree this into a bit of a veggie smoothie that we can then add the eggs, the oil, and the other ingredients to to make our pancakes. So smooth is fine. Blenders would be fine for this as well. I'm going to see what this thing's got and do it all at once. Might give it a little bit of help with the sweet potato. Those of you that are doing the sweet pancakes, uh, if there are any of you doing that one instead of the savory tonight, again, pretty much straightforward. Um, instead of all the savory ingredients that we put in, the onions and the herbs and things, you're going to be putting in the banana, the cinnamon, the, the sugar. There's no order in which these have to go in in, in particular. And uh, once these are all into their smoothie state, then we can add the oil and the vinegar still and the eggs and stuff like that. So no, no specific order that they have to go in. All right, into the food processor we go. And I'm going to give this one a little bit of help. If your food processor doesn't have a stick with it, you might just need to stop it a couple times, scrape down the edges, and then just let it keep going. All right, sorry for the noise. All right, another little trick. If your food processor is having trouble uh, breaking it down and getting the liquid content out of the vegetables, one thing you can do is add in the liquid component from the recipe here just to give it a bit more, I guess, liquid. So we've got our two tablespoons of olive oil that can go in now and our two teaspoons of apple cider vinegar. Doesn't have to be exactly precise. So I'm going to use my already dirty tablespoon and just not quite fill it. So approximately, that wasn't quite full. Let's go two teaspoons of apple cider vinegar. Now, don't skip out on the vinegar step because we are using baking soda. Another little thing I might just go on quickly, the difference between baking soda and baking powder. Uh, baking powder has baking soda in it, but baking powder also has cream of tartar which acts as an acid with this base to form the bubbles as soon as it gets moistened or heat and heated. Okay, so baking powder is used in a recipe where there's not another acid for it to react with, so it comes with its acid, and then as soon as you add moisture, it activates and creates the bubbles that we want. Baking soda 
doesn't come with its own acid, so we need to make sure the recipe has acid in it in order to react it. If ever a recipe you're making tastes like baking soda or you've got that little bit of flavor coming through, it means we haven't got enough acid to react with the amount of baking soda that we had in the recipe. So that's your indication to make an adjustment later if that so happens or just double check your measurements. Uh, that's how you can balance that out. You shouldn't taste the baking soda. It should just be there to fully react through with the acid that's in the dish, depending on what you're making. Okay, so on that note, we don't want to add them straight away together if we can, because we're going to get all the bubbles disappearing. Ideally, what we want to have is have this vinegar mixed all the way through the one part, and then when we put the dry ingredients in, they come together and they make even bubbles throughout the mixture, as opposed to just reacting in one little spot at once. Now, this is a much more critical in a lot of other recipes that are going to get baked and put into the oven. In this case, it's not super critical. We're still going to get quite a bit of rise from the egg as well in this recipe. So not the end of the world if they don't get added exactly the right amount of time. Okay, how's everyone going? Welcome Kim and Neville. Awesome guys. Who else have we missed? Okay, sorry I can't scroll to everyone. Uh, all right, so if everyone's got their mixture going, I'm going to give this one more little mix and I'll show you what texture we're after. So this is still a little bit too chunky. I mean, it would be fine if you're happy with a little bit of texture in the savory pancake, but I'm going to put this a little bit smoother, I guess, just to show you how, uh, how much of a real life pancake we can create with vegetables. <laughs> so let's give that another blend. There we go. For you, those of you using a Thermomix that absolutely need uh, times and measurements, that was about 27 seconds on about eight speed. But I never really go by that, so I just turn it on. Okay, so yes, you see the texture that we've got there? It's liquidy, and that's exactly what we want. We don't want to necessarily have chunks in it, if, if you will, if we want a smooth pancake. So to that, let's add our salt. Now, even though we've got onion in that, I actually have eaten this quite happily, still with the sweet toppings on it, or something like peanut butter and butter and honey or something like that. Now, I know that sounds crazy because there's onion in it, but just wait till you taste it. Um, it can go both ways if you need it to. So that being said, you might put a little bit less salt than you would otherwise if you were just having it as a savory dish. But that's just something to consider. Those of you that are really avoiding all forms of sugar and fruit, um, go ahead with the extra little bit of flavor there. So I'm just gonna do the one teaspoon of salt. And then we need to add our eggs, our flour and our baking soda. Now we're kind of caught up to the point where I'd like to start heating the pans because I'd like them to be fully heated. Have you ever had that experience when you're making pancakes? And well, I don't know if anyone hasn't had this experience that the first ones just never turn out as good as any batch after that. Why? I think it's because of the pan and how uh, well evenly heated it is through. If anyone else wants to give me some exact science on that, that'd be wonderful. Um, but for some reason, the first ones are never as good as anyone cooked in that same pan thereafter. So let's just um, increase our odds a little bit. You might, okay, let's jump to that actually now. You might wanna have two pans going at once just to speed up the process, especially if you've doubled the batch or the kids are kind of beating down the house because they're extremely hungry. So we can get this going a little bit faster. It doesn't necessarily involve too much more coordination because we'll do one and then we'll do the other. So don't freak out about running two at the same time. You can prepare two pans now. If you can, at all possible with these pancakes, they cook way nicer and way better with a lid. So if you can facilitate a lid on them. If you don't have a big enough lid for your big pan, or you're, you've misplaced it at somebody else's house, another little workaround tip is another pan up top, upside down. Okay, so that can be a lid in a pinch. And I'm gonna use that tonight to show you that it can be a lid in a pinch. Let's get this on. And I'm gonna heat them slowly, but we're gonna let them 
heat for a little bit longer than usual. So I'm just going to heat that on six. Uh, even five would be okay, so half heat. Depending on how hot your burners are, you might know your stove a bit different. If you're using gas, we can go probably the lowest uh, gas setting on whatever high burners you're on. Um, that'd be sufficient just to get, get the heat distributed evenly throughout the pan. If these cook on too high, of, too high of a heat, they'll burn much before they'll cook through the middle. So that's the only, I guess, downside to using really nutritious stuff is they do take a little bit longer to cook through and we do want to cook that moisture through into the veggies in the middle. So let's get those heating. That's all happening. Lids on there. Good to go. All right. So coming back to our mixture. Okay. So we need our six eggs into here. Now, good habit. I don't know if you've already started doing this, cracking individual eggs into a separate bowl. It's kind of Murphy's law that as soon as you stop doing that or feel that you've had such a good run, you don't need to keep doing that, then you'll get a bad egg. So it's just a little habit to get into, especially if the kids are helping you and there's a high likelihood of getting shell in the mixture, then we do the separate bowl trick. So six eggs, preferably if you have access to organic eggs at all, that would be amazing. And it's definitely worth the money. I know it's one of those things, it's so hard seeing them sit side by side on the shelf in the supermarket. One of them is nearly $10 for organic and the other ones are even $1.50 I've seen for a dozen eggs. I just, oh, you just can't imagine the difference. Well, you probably could with that amount of difference in price. Um, but it does make a massive difference in terms of nutrients. So even, even if you just look at the omega-3 content, omega-3 and omega-6, which are the essential amino acids that our body needs, sorry, essential fatty acids the body needs, the, their balance is perfectly in balance for what the body needs in an organic egg, but it can be out of balance by up to 30 to 1 in a conventional or even um, a lot of the free range eggs nowadays are not that much better than a barn egg. So, or cage eggs. So it does make a big difference with the eggs um, to go organic. That's a big one that's important. All right, I'm just gonna rinse my fingers of the egg. We'll get that all happening in the, in the food processor. Okay, so I'm just gonna mix them in quickly first. One question I get is why didn't we add the eggs in before when we did the rest of the veggies? Not super critical here. If you're in a rush, you could do that and get away with it. Sometimes it can make eggs a little bit tough if they get over blended. Not super critical. Um, if that made it possible for you to have this recipe on the table five minutes faster, then please go ahead. Okay, so we need one cup of buckwheat flour. I'm going to use two half measures so I can fit them in the jar here. So one half plus one half. This is the proper measure for uh, volume based measurements by the way. So level to the top, not nearly to the top or mounded at the top. This is the proper measure for what a recipe and not just my recipes um, should should call for is a level cup. And then our two teaspoons of baking soda. Same thing goes here. The only thing I'll say is if we have chunks in there, then you can use your fingers to dissolve the chunks. Just because we might not get that effectively happening in the food processor by the time we put that all in. So two teaspoons level, and then we'll dissolve any pieces there just so we don't get a, don't bite into a piece of soap. <laughs> And again, that's baking soda, not baking powder. It will make a difference. All right, quick blend. By now our pans should be getting quite near to being ready. Okay, so there's our pancake batter. 
So it is very liquidy, which is what we want. There's our pancake batter. Well, you might think it's thick compared to a traditional pancake because we've got all that beautiful fiber in there from the veggies that no one's going to know about. <laughs> okay, so that's exactly what we're looking for right there. So give it a little stir down the bottom in case it didn't quite get down there. And then we're ready to go to our pans. And provided they are hot enough, hopefully even enough, some space so everyone can see. All right, so I start off the pan with a little bit of high heat safe oil. Now that could be some organic ghee if you're having dairy or it could be the third press coconut oil. When I say third press I mean not extra virgin and not virgin coconut oil but the third press of the coconut after that. Sometimes it's called cooking coconut oil, sometimes it's called deodorized coconut oil. Um, but the idea is, is that by that point, after the third press, it has less of the delicate parts of the coconut oil that can go off at high temperature. So it's a more heat stable oil being the third press. Okay, so we'll just put a little bit of that in the pan just to create a bit of a lubricated surface initially. And then we shouldn't need any more after our first batch of pancakes is out of the way. Now your choice as far as the size of the pancakes. I'll never forget as a kid, we always begged my dad to make, um, he called them lucky dollars or dollar pancakes. And in Canada, the money is actually called, well, the $1 coin is called a loony because there's a picture of a loon, which is a bird on the front of it. And the $2 coin, when it came out, then got called the toonie. So a loony and a toonie. So we asked if he could make them that small. And he tried really hard, but they always generally ended up the size of a, I don't know, grapefruit flattened. Um, so your choice. I think uh, here in Australia, we would call them pikelets if they were little, or pancakes if they were big, or monster cookies if they took up the whole pan, which is how my loved, loved husband one does, does pancakes. Extra fun for flipping. All right, I think we are ready to rock. Now, we're probably gonna to need to turn the heat down once we get this happening, and we're gonna listen for the sizzle and see how hot we've got here. Okay, no sizzle at all. So we're gonna keep it as it is for the little bit um, on the six setting. And as this pan heats up, we'll, we'll be able to tell by how quick they're cooking and how brown the bottoms are. So I like to keep to about a third of a cup. It's not quite full, so I guess as a measure, it's probably only a quarter of a cup of batter. That's kind of my favorite pancake size but that's completely up to your liking. So notice how it does have a bit of texture to it. So I'm giving it just a little nudge to flatten it down slightly. And then when we put the lid on, which is my upside down frying pan, then they're gonna actually pop up a little bit. So we'll let them go. So see, we just did one at a time. No need to freak out. <laughs> you don't have to be multitasking and doing one with each, each hand. It's actually better if we get one going and then the other with a bit of space in between because then you're not rushing to take them both off at the same time too. Now, last I did this, the this burner's a bit hotter. Let's see. Yeah, a little bit hotter. Okay, so we got a bit of sizzle happening there. Easy. Not too much spread. Let's get the lid on that. That's gonna create a bit of steam so that we can kind of steam cook them, which is going to help cook them more through the middle and around the tops rather than just frying off the bottom. So it's a way to get a more even cook. It's even gonna help them be a little bit fluffier as well. So if you don't have a lid, not the end of the world. If you do, um, you'll find that you'll cook it longer on the first side and very little time on the second side um, with the lid. Okay, so while they're cooking, uh, maybe stay close just till you get the hang of your burners, your pans, how your batch and your chosen recipe is working. If you were to be serving this for a large group of people for brunch on the weekend and you did this a couple times in advance, you would have uh, the option to maybe have a third pan going at the same time or one trick that I've done is actually get a large slow cooker Turn it on in advance to maybe low or medium and then leave that be preheated 
so that you can put the hot cooked pancakes into the slow cooker and that'll keep them stay warm until you serve them. Or you can preheat an oven safe container and, and leave that in the oven and then keep topping it up in the oven if you'd like as well. The slow cooker I find is a little bit more energy efficient and a little bit more portable if you're serving it out to a barbecue or out to a, um, I guess the veranda or something. Okay. Uh, the other thing I can say is have a think about your toppings because that is where the magic really happens. This is just the canvas. This is like the, the creative canvas down the bottom. So topping wise, if you're having the savory ones, uh, I know I've outlined some ideas there. Today I happened to just look through the fridge. I've got some leftover bean dip that I'm going to have with them. A bit of spinach, a bit of tomato. If you've got ripe avocados, that's delicious. If you wanted to make up a little tuna mixture or some smoked salmon, um, if you're having that, you could have some olives. There's just, I guess, no end to that. If you're doing a special breakfast on the weekend, you could even saute up some onions and mushrooms or bacon if you're having that um, and have that with them as well. So tons of options up your sleeve. Let's have a check on these ones first. Good, cool. Okay, so see how we've got a little bit of puffiness happening because we steamed them. I'm just looking at them now. They're not quite ready to flip. So some indications of that, can you see, it might not be possible in the camera, but I'll try and point it out. Right here on this edge, you've still got a bit of glistening um, of moisture that you can see, whereas the insides here, clearly the middle of the pan is a lot hotter. So these look a bit drier on the inside edges of these pancakes here. Okay, so I can tell that it's not quite ready to flip because it's still really wet looking on the outside of those. We can still check it though, if you want to see how well they hold. Okay, so it's holding well on the inside, but I'm guessing it's going to smear. Yeah, see how we're getting it smearing, it's squishing together. We want it to hold its shape all the way through. So I'm going to leave that cook a little bit longer. And we'll check the other one. Because this one cooks a lot faster. Look at that. <laughs> okay, so those are ready to flip. Quite a bit fluffier and notice there's not... Well, there's a little bit of that um, moisture there, so I might not even have it centered. But this is all while the pan heats up evenly. Our second batch will be fine. Okay, so first one. There we go. Not too bad, not too brown underneath. That's looking all right. If your pan does cook really unevenly and the center is done a lot more than the outside, then flip them so that the outside is now cooking in the middle. And it just makes, makes things a bit more even. So outside into the middle. There we go. All right, so I'm going to turn that one down a touch and this one up a touch just for now. Okay, so that's pretty much the process. I'll take those off here in a sec and get them happening. Does anyone have any questions? How are you going? How, how is this all happening? Do we have pancakes in the pan? Are we having disaster happen? Is it quick and easy? Did the kids come in and interrupt? How are you going? Questions? How can you see that this is actually doable in your life? Is this something that you think can be a game changer for you or for your household, et cetera, et cetera? I would love to know um, because, you know, it's pretty hard being on this side of the camera and not knowing how you guys are going. Um, even if you're watching the recorded version of this, do please still interact. It, it really is great for you to have that engagement as well and for me to clarify anything that's not clear for you. Um, please let us know how you're going. Okay. So a little bit of sticking on our first one, that's all right. This pan just takes a little bit longer to heat up through the middle. So see how the middle is definitely done and the outside wasn't. But overall they hold together fairly nicely. There we go. And they're pretty forgiving. Oh, smelling good. I can smell that. Uh, the chives actually that we put in there, fresh chives, probably because they came straight from the garden. Okay, so other than that, uh, a bigger batch, it does double easily, does triple even if you'd like. I know it seems like a lot of eggs all at once, but again, we're gonna get a lot of pancakes out of this. And like I said before, don't 
Don't waste your time putting layers of wax paper or baking paper between every single one in the freezer. Just freeze them on the vertical like you would a loaf of bread, bread slices, um, in a container that's obviously tall enough for that. And then that way when you take them out of the freezer, that they won't have compacted themselves frozen together. They'll be easier to separate. So freezing them on end. Okay. Very doable, Monique. Yes, awesome. <laughs> Amanda and Zoe, looks awesome. Second batch, but looks so much better this time. Good, that's good to hear. And it will get better and easier every single time you do it. So thank you very much. Uh, good, just turned your first three. Thanks, guys. I wanna hear if Zoe's able to help out with these two, Amanda. Oh no, Zoe's on holidays, I keep forgetting. All right, these ones should be about done by now. Let's have a check. Okay, so your level of doneness is going to be probably different than mine only because I've learned that everyone likes their pancake different. So I say that that's done. Keeping in mind that when you cut it open, the inside might still be nice and soft um, in the middle. So it's definitely cooked, but it's got that nice soft texture. But once this cools, and especially once you've frozen it and then retoasted it, that's gonna be perfect. If we go too much longer than that, they might just feel a little bit dry, but you might prefer that. So just know that you have that option. If you want them to be drier than that, then you'll need to lower the heat and cook them a bit longer. If we keep it at that same heat, they will tend to burn on the sides before they cook through the middle. Okay, that's pretty perfect for me. I'm pretty happy with that one. Um, so we'll take that batch off, noting that this pan clearly cooks longer. And depending on your pan, um, these are amazing Australian-made um, solid Technics pans that are a hybrid between a cast iron pan and a stainless steel pan. So I find in these ones, once they're heated up properly like that, once we've done our first sacrificial batch, uh, then we can, do the, we can do the next batch without having to add more oil to the pan. So let's get those happening. It creates a natural non-stick surface, which is why we actually want these pans to look fully black. That's a sign of a really good pan. Really good use of the pan. Okay, lid on and we'll take these ones off. There we go. So the sacrificial anodes weren't that bad after all. <laughs> I have definitely had worse. All right, so shouldn't have a need to add any more um, grease to that. I like saving the, the fat option to have as butter on top after. Nice little ones, maybe one in the middle. So easy. So you should get a pile about that big <laughs> out of this recipe. It goes a long way. And there we have it. So now that we've got our first couple of pancakes, let's just figure out how we want to plate them up. I've done some really fun stacks. You might have seen that photo online. So we could put one layer of tomato or something down, then another layer of pancake. And if you really want to impress someone, tell you a little trick. If you're serving a massive stack of pancakes, let's say you did like the big size ones and you served that for a whole group of six people at once and they were like, mm, pancake cake? Um, it's really fun, it's a great reaction. And then you can just cut into it like you would a normal birthday cake with all the layers in between like the icing. Anyways, a bit of a fun way to have them. So let's just make a stack like that and we'll bring them all the way back over here along with all my toppings that we're gonna add. I've got spinach, tomato, like I said, olives, a little bit limited. I was hoping the avocados would be ready, but they're not. So very simple and easy. Ideally, you've got these toppings ready in advance so that you can eat these straight when they're fresh and hot. But let's make a quick little stack. Tomato, spinach, <laughs> bean dip or hummus or pesto or extra butter or cheese or 
grated cheese, guacamole, whatever you fancy on top. Oh, and I forgot to tell you the little trick. If you did a big cake and it was going to be a Jenga cake and topple over, just use a few little skewers and hide them under the top layer of the pancake and then they won't fall over. A little trick. And there we have it. Savory pancakes. Or if you've done sweet pancakes, please let me know if the magic trick worked and if you're able to hide in the veggies. And that's dinner, lunch, breakfast, whatever you feel. But yes, please do share your photos. Let me know how you've stacked it up or served it or devoured it. I like seeing empty plates too with happy kids on the other end. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much for coming to cook with me. Savory pancakes. If you have any questions, continue to type them in, ask us, engage everything. We're here for you. And again, if you have special recipe requests, I can't guarantee that I can do them straight away, um, but please do send them in as well. Thank you so much for coming to cook with me and have a wonderful dinner.